show Traver, and I don't have a call sign yet. I just got my he got it. All right. All right. I'm Jock, WB4DOC. <laughs> Jim, W4UX. Steve, K four LKP. Henry, W4HHS. Terry, NK4B. Doug, W4STH. Stacy, W1LLO. Steven, KP4JW. Uh, David, W4OIL, sorry. John, K1PPE. Mary, KN4LKO. W3NKS. Harold, N4HER. Steve, WA3RTC. Bruce, WA4TC. Ken, K2KSK. David, KN4BVT. Manager passed my job. All right. David, KC4X. Yeah, I'm Randy, NC4RT. Jeff, AC4YF. And WD4SQ. Jim, AC4SQ. I'm Pete, KA4JAH. Bill, W4EXT. Jake, KF4YF. Bill, WD4TY. And I'm AAU, Bobby. KM Floor and TK Wayne. I'm WS4 and C. Henry W2 DZO. Okay. Good crowd tonight. Uh, thanks for coming out. I've got a couple of announcements. The uh, project group will not be meeting uh, this month. Normally they meet on the third Tuesday. Uh, they will not be meeting. Uh, Terry has been. Uh, Terry Brown has been good enough to bring some CQ and QST magazines. He's trying to give them away, and he does not want to take them home. So if you'll uh, come up here on your way out or whenever and uh, look through these and take the ones you want, Terry would appreciate it. My wife does too. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Don Edwards, are you taking photos? Uh, it's time to uh, elect new officers for next year. Don is the uh, chair of that committee, and he's got a couple of things to uh, tell us about. Okay. Uh, the nominating committee met on October, excuse me, August 19th, and uh, that was me, Terry Brown, and Dale, WB9SL, Harold, N4BHR, Mike, k 4 We talked to the previous officers, Sam. Uh, and I 4 TG Doug, uh, W4 STH, right? Stacy, uh, W1 LLL, and I can't pay for it. They all have agreed to serve another year, so that makes this a very simple process. Uh, we will open for uh, nominations from the floor for October. Uh, don't just nominate somebody because it's it's a working job because uh, we expect a little work out of you. And uh, Mike, you were on that committee, weren't you? Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Well, make sure I've got everybody. The uh, bylaws provide for us to uh, the most recent set for us to. Uh, we moved it up a month, so we're really technically a month behind, but since we don't have to do a search, we're fine. Uh, uh, floor nomination procedures at uh, September meeting, uh, and of course the person has to be a full life member. Uh, that's it. Thank you, Don. Thank you. I had forgotten we have uh, a couple of items for show and tell tonight. Uh, recently, the internet was uh, not functioning well at the club, and the reason for that is the squirrel chewed through the cable. <laughs> we'll see. If you want to pass that around, you can. That's uh, <laughs> right. This is the this is the lightning part. If you'll uh, look in the end of this connector, you'll see uh, what lightning can do. So. <laughs> uh, I think the squirrel is D D O A, as they say. Who discovered? Yeah, Ken. Uh, 
in, in uh, trying to see why remote hands wasn't working for a couple of days. Um, I, uh, at that time, wanted a new spectrum. And um, I uh, never even had to come in the building. I went around and tested the signal outside, climbing a pole out there, and there it to be discovered. Which is, you know, good and bad. I'm glad that we finally got a diagnosis and a remedy, because since we put this internet in, it has not been as reliable as we wanted. So now remote hands should be uh, no problem. 24-7, except uh, we're in here using it. Yeah. Uh, the guy told me, uh, by the way, uh, some of you probably know this, but he told me a phone package. Why would squirrels chew that table that they can't eat, as well as chewing my, the ropes on my dipole? Yes. And he said that um, the reason is that their teeth never stop growing. And they chew on things to gnaw them down because if they didn't, they starve to death because they wouldn't be able to eat. So Thanks for that, Ken. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was wondering. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, That's very good. if anybody wanted to get access to the old ham, to get on there. And we'll talk about <laughs> thank you, Ken, and thank, thank you for your help on that. I wanted to bring up uh, a topic uh, next year is going to be our 90th anniversary. Uh, this club was founded in uh, 1930. Technically, the anniversary will be in December, but uh, for purposes of celebration, uh, next year is wide open. Uh, the board has uh, begun discussion a little bit about what kind of uh, celebration we could have, some things that we could do. Uh, I would like for everybody in here to be thinking about things we could do uh, for the 90th celebration. And if you want to email me or uh, another uh, club officer or uh, write it down and bring it next meeting, uh, some of the things that have been discussed uh, were a special QSL card, uh, special events by individuals or groups, uh, open house at the club uh, with media invited, uh, signs and banners, uh, updated QRZ page, uh, history and photos <laughs> on the website, uh, special 90th banner for the ham fest and field day. I think that's, I already said that. Uh, it was suggested we have a week of festivities with the mayor proclaiming amateur radio week. Our special suffix to each member's call sign and awards uh, for folks in the United States or uh, internationally making contact with the most uh, W4NC members, award certificates. But uh, I know uh, somebody in here has a great idea and we would like to have it. So if you'll be thinking about that, and we'll be uh, discussing the uh, our plans in the meeting here as we. Uh, get a little bit closer to next year, but I wanted you to be thinking about it. 90th and 90 years is a big deal. And in 10 years, who knows you know, where some of us may be. Uh, 90 years is a really big deal. And we were talking at the board meeting, and we think there's only one other club in the United States that may be older than we are. It's a really, really huge deal. So it's worth uh, celebrating. So yeah. that, that historical point? There's only six years between the start of this club and the first radio telephony. Right, that's right. QST had a spread on the Raleigh Club for 50th. For 50, right. This that's past, what <laughs> This past time. Yes. 50, and they had like, what was it, about five or six of the original members there in that picture of, uh, of uh, <coughs> celebrating their 50th anniversary. Right. I don't think we're going to have any original members. No. <laughs> we may have a photo of them. <laughs> okay. John Kippy <clears throat> wants a couple of minutes tonight uh, to present uh, something to the membership. <laughs> I went to Shelby, and uh, what I went there looking for was a backup radio for my uh, A47 that it worked on. 
and I couldn't find one. But what I did find was this. It's a 757. Works fine. We we'll hook it up, put it on an antenna, and we made contacts. Uh, the next thing I found was this amplifier. It's one of it's, it, it's before Ameritron put their name on the front, it's on the back. So, but it works. It puts out 400 watts, and we tested it, and we made contacts all over the place. This one was a tuner. We picked it up. I picked it up for 30 bucks, and uh, we used that on the station to help tune in the antenna that we randomly put up. We put up an like inverted V that was the apex was at about. 30 to 25 feet, something like that. And uh, we used this type of mass system. I don't know if anybody's, I'm sure most of you have been to a ham fest and saw these army masks they set up. Well, there's eight four foot pieces of aluminum and uh, the rings to guide off with. The um, what they call a platform to set it on, when in reality it's tapped on. But it uses, it makes a good stand. And uh, that I got for $55. So, and then that last day I'm going through and I meet this guy and he's got this TS-140. Works fine. Um, I picked it up for $200. The reason why I'm bringing this all up to you is because I have heard it said many times by a lot of people that going from technician to general is too big of an expense. They can't afford it. Well, if you're in the right place at the right time, you can pick up a radio for $200 and it works. Or $300 and it works. Like I said, this whole thing right here, did it cost me $700? Every minute. And it's it's a station that's going into my camper, so that's where it's going to be. But uh, I wanted to bring it here and let y'all see it and understand that yes, if you can afford to buy the HF gear that you see out there, people a lot of people using, that's great. But if you can't, you can still get on the air and still enjoy enjoy HF the way I have many years. So. Anyway, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, John. <laughs> so the uh, key to that is if you need, if you need equipment, uh, go with John to the ham fest. Go with Dale. Okay, our treasurer, Kent, is not here tonight. He had another commitment. Uh, he uh, texted that our current... Uh, Balance in the treasury is $2,343.94. Harlan, our uh, Aries Oxcom leader, is also absent tonight. He has had uh, a deployment or two uh, deployments and had training and stuff, and so he's a little bit behind the eight ball on tour to Tanglewood. He is going to have, uh, he's going to be sending an email to everyone that signed up for Tour to Tanglewood. And he's going to have on September the 17th, from 6 o'clock p.m. until 7 o'clock p.m., an online meeting. You can do it on your phone. That's uh, September 17th, 1800. Also, as far as tour to Tanglewood goes, uh, we still need help on Sunday. Saturday is just about covered, but uh, if there's any way uh, uh, you can volunteer for Sunday, that would uh, be a big help. Dale, do you want to give us a repeater report and a test report? Okay. Thank you. Well, first, I always want to thank the VEs for getting the right spot for uh, administering the test tonight. We had, uh, uh, let's see, several of them had to leave. Mike, um, Mary, and W3ABB. And there's several others over here. Uh, in fact, if you stand up, Mike. 
who else? Saw Henry. Yeah, here he is. Your eyes aren't too good. But anyway, thank these folks in uh, Mark. Thank these folks for the uh, we had, uh, what was it, six, six folks, six folks tonight. My memory's four, but all of them passed. One passed is extra, two passed their uh, generals, and the other three passed their techs. And if you pass tonight, you're here. I know some of you have left, you please stand up. And I'd ask all of you in here, remember your first day when you got on the air, you got the license. Some of us, it's waiting 90 days, seeing if it came in the mailbox. Um, for the last few years, pardon, or longer, or long, yeah, or longer in some cases, um, or get lost in the mail, and others uh, email. But remember that excitement. So when you hear these folks on the air, go ahead, drop what you're doing if you can, on two meters, and give them a call and say congratulations and help them out. I know they'll appreciate it, and they'll remember you as their first contact. So please make sure you do that, folks. Now, as far as the uh, repeater switching over there, as John mentioned, we went down to Shelby and found all kinds of different parts. Some of them we didn't need. Some of them we had to get out of dead equipment. But that's all the way you can only way you get parts now. So we're using some of those work on the repeaters. The 6-4 machine is still up at Baptist Hospital. That's the fusion machine. Still have some interference there, but uh, working on it to get it down, uh, get, uh, put some filters on it. Some extra pieces of a hard line, so just stay tuned. But it does work. Just limited coverage. 440 system is not up there because there's a 30 S30 over 9 signal on the input of the 440 machine, so it wouldn't work too well unless you're in the same room out there in the penthouse. So we decided to keep that down until we could figure out what's going on. The 47 machine is uh, still working well up at the uh, Sour Mountain. David and I, thank you, David, and going out there and going to the gym and. Uh, with some other folks uh, several times trying to make sure we get things adjusted and there's still more work to do there. The Echolink node, the one at my home is working okay, and I think, uh, I think it was Mark mentioned, I think the iPhone, the iPhone is working now, yeah, so I can do it. Or it can, yeah, thank you. The one back here, we, we uh, it's, it looked like it, uh, I know this never happened to any of you, got hit with a not only a power outage, but right in the middle of some Windows update, even though it's turned off. So we'll see what we can figure out on that, or just take the thing back home with the interface, which I think is blown up and fix it. But that's a secondary uh, point. No. Other than that, did I miss anything there? Thank you guys. That's about it. We're still working on the uh, internet up on the mountain. Uh, it's supposed to be completely wide open and go into our router. Uh, it didn't quite come out that way. It looks like there's still some ports blocked. So some of the remote software used to get up there is also blocked right now. So it'll be another <coughs> trip up here, I think, in a few weeks, probably after two weeks. Try to get that going. They, yes, sir. You might mention that the SIP4 machine is still set up automatic switching from the digital. And oh, yeah, room. thank you. And, and you've used that, Bill. It's yeah. Switch is okay, right? Yeah. So if any, again, from Clemens. From Clemens. if any of you have the Fusion uh, or the new Yesu radios, I know some of you do, and uh, you want to talk to somebody else on Fusion or to uh, an analog, just with the normal radio, it does switch, it switches okay. Yeah. So um, thanks for bringing that up. That's, a, that's an important point. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Folks. Thank you, Dale. Uh, most of you know Mason from Trazo. Uh, he uh, passed his extra tonight, and now he'll be able to go up and down the entire band. <laughs> you make a few contacts. I'll help the band. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, this is the last meeting before our ham fest. Uh, David is going to present to us uh, some information about that. I wanted to add something to what they had said about the repeater there at 6-4. Um, we found out that when the hospital is really busy, uh, that's when the interference shows up. <clears throat> so if you're on it later at night, I think it's kind of calm down and probably use it just fine. We, we've used it, a few of us have. Uh, but yeah, our uh, ham fest coming up October the 12th. That's at the uh, Robin Hood Road Baptist Church. 
Steve uh, has made arrangements for us once again, and it'll be from 7.30 in the morning to about 11.30, uh, you know, depending on how the crowd goes. Uh, we're going to set up a test table so that if you see something there you want to buy and you want to test it, there'll be 12 volts there, probably a dummy load, uh, whatever else we can think of to put at the test table. And uh, we're also going to set up a table or two or three. You know, their place had a lot of tables, and if they're not being used by vendors coming in, then, uh, we can fill it up with club members. Equipment. You got equipment you want to move along? Uh, bring it. And we'll uh, we'll put it on the table. You need to put your name on it somehow, and you need to put a price on it and your phone number, so that if you're out wandering around looking at stuff, somebody sees something that you have that they want, then uh, they can call you and you guys can negotiate. We're going to set up a table for the vagabond net. And uh, those guys are always welcome. Several of your members in here, and uh, we treat them specially. And uh, please do donate to them. I don't know what they do with funding, other than occasionally it comes back to us for different things. But uh, I do visit with them at least. Uh, we're also going to. This is kind of off the top of my head. If you get, if you have a project that you built and you like to show it to other people, bring with them. You know, we'll, we'll find a place to put it and uh, have a look at it. And as always, the admission is $5. And there was a guy many years ago who used to say, cheap. And most of you, if you know who that was, you're dating yourself. Uh, good old Alfred. So uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, look this week. Maybe that was there for a reason. <laughs> it was. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, look out this week. I'm going to have uh, a mailer come out to you, but I have to talk to Don about that. But this week or next week, uh, sometime before the end, we don't want to get too early. We want people to forget. Any questions? Okay. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Well, we still have a load in Friday night. Oh, yeah. Load in uh, Friday evening. Start about uh, well wherever you might get there. I guess we'll work that out. But we're going to stay till seven o'clock. So we're hoping uh, ACDC will make it. Um, that's, you never know about these things. So we're hoping to have some vendors there, but uh, you just never know. Anyway, it's on the website, and uh, I'll send out the flyer, and we'll see where it goes. Thank you, David. And I would mention, uh, we're going to need volunteers uh, that Friday at 3 o'clock to set up tables, move tables around. And then the, uh, the vendor move-in will be at 5, from 5 to 6.30. Uh, also, uh, Saturday morning at 6 a.m., I know that's early, but 6 a.m. or 6.30, uh, we need volunteers to help move in vendors at that time and the benefit of volunteering and being there is that you get to see everything before everybody else so so it's a good uh, it's a good benefit to be there and uh, help out and you know get first glance at you know what what you might uh, you might be interested in our uh, presentation tonight is uh, uh, from Dr. Robert Meyer, we call him Bobby, but <laughs> tonight we're going to call you Dr. Meyer. Okay. <laughs> and uh, he's got an excellent presentation for us. So we're Thank yours. you. Okay. Well, uh, let's first show the splash screen, in case any of you missed it earlier. Okay. And if I go out of frame uh, back there, let me know. All right. Uh, how many people remember uh, July 20th, 1969? Remember what they were doing? Okay, about a third. Pretty good. I think that's the highest I've seen uh, any time I've delivered this before. All right. How many people think we didn't go to the moon? <laughs> good. <laughs> no, I, nope, don't need somebody to say no. Okay. Uh, part of this would actually uh, would actually be proof for uh, that we did. Okay. So, how many people here today could travel uh, out of state? without GPS? Quite a few, okay. 
and not get lost, by the way. <laughs> oh, that cuts it down some. Okay, that cuts it down some. All right. Well, 50 uh, years ago, about uh, plus about a month, um, a set of people did that. They traveled, in fact, about uh, uh, 800,000 kilometers out of town and back, and they did it without GPS, mostly because it didn't exist yet. In fact, it couldn't have existed without them doing that. So what this uh, is about is the science that was necessary to make Apollo work and the science that we got out of it that we see around us today. Uh, right now, anybody got anything on their person that they think would not have been here without the Apollo program? Good, somebody's got a cell phone, and I know somebody back there's got a GPS antenna. Okay, how many people here have Velcro? Okay, that would almost certainly not have been marketed if not for Apollo. Whether or not it existed is questionable. Okay, and cruise control. It's a very good bet that, ah, yes, question? Cruise Oh, you have cruise, okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, and also bring up lasers here if we have the time. By the way, if you have uh, questions or comments during this, uh, in most cases you can bring them up. Okay, how many people, whoops, oh, I'm going to do this a couple times during this talk, I'll warn you right now. I have to change the uh, correct index. Okay, how many people uh, remember uh, who said that and any of you remember when it was said, were any of you watching? Okay, one person at least was actually watching. Two people. Right. Okay. JFK it will committed this nation to landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. Before the end before this decade is out, and he said that in nineteen sixty one, May twenty fifth. Yes. That to this day is one of the coolest things I've ever heard on TV. <laughs> I heartily agree with you. I mean I was you know, I was young back then. I was in college and all that. Was still the coolest thing in the world I've ever heard on TV. I hardly agree with you. One of the best things I've ever heard a president say. <laughs> okay. I hate to admit, though, I was, didn't actually hear that with my own ears. Or if I did, I didn't understand it at the time. <laughs> okay. Make sure I do the right index here. Whoops. Grab it. Okay. Now, there's a little problem. How many people would have, at that time, those who heard it, how many people thought that was impossible to go to the moon? Okay, did anybody here take an engineering course using the textbook University Physics? One person. Okay, two. Okay. Uh, what decade was that? Was it before 1989? Okay. There was a chapter in the book, I'm sure you'll confirm, on proving you can't go to the moon, right? Right. One of the uh, university physics, the standard textbook for engineers, used as a demonstration of not only finding out what you can do, but being able to find out what you can't do. And they used as their example for that going to the moon. You can't do it with a single shot. You'd burn up uh, in, the, in the atmosphere as soon as you launched uh, Jules Verne style. You can't do it with a uh, single uh, rocket vehicle because uh, the uh, amount of uh, fuel that you would need would basically you'd start moving the uh, moon around you'd move your target around just from the way to your rocket uh, and there were other things so they proved all the ways you couldn't go to the moon and by the way when apollo did it they went around every one of those <laughs> but that was the point they had to find ways that everybody had been told was impossible Anybody know the phrase, to the moon, Alice? <laughs> Jackie Gleason. Jackie Gleason. Right. Again, an expression of what was impossible. All right. So the problem, ah, there we go. So the problem, we had to solve a couple problems at scales of distance, speed, and weight. Distance. Nobody had uh, been more than uh, 40,000 kilometers, before, excuse me, 20,000 kilometers away from their starting point. Now we're going to go 20 times as far. Speed. Nobody had ever been above, at that time, I think, Mach 4. And yet, to uh, go to the moon, you got to go Mach 37. Weight. Uh, nobody had ever uh, built a vehicle at the time that was airborne, or was at least above the ground, 
that uh, weighed at the time the target would have actually been 20, 000, 20 million tons. Excuse me. Uh, I'm sorry, 20,000 tons. Get the decimal point right. <coughs> um, and other things that were either never imagined or never encountered before. And a lot of them were total, were completely unexpected at the time when the advisors told Kennedy that going to the moon was uh, a good idea. And one thing that a lot of, if, how many people here saw the movie Apollo 13? Almost everybody, good. Uh, so if for this audience, it's not as, it would be uh, more un, uh, expected. But a lot of people have only seen Apollo 13, they think that NASA just picked the best solution and did their best solution. But NASA was the epitome, the extreme, of systems engineering. They tried everything. In general, uh, they, for almost anything, even the most minuscule, they tried what was expected to work, what was almost sure to work, and what only a few people thought would work and most people thought wouldn't. And ironically, we got some of our best results out of the ones that people that almost nobody thought would work. So they tried familiar, they tried unfamiliar. And so uh, how, how many people have a guess what, the, uh, what technology they used to bring the rocks from the surface of the moon up into the lunar module? Any guesses? A clothesline. A clothesline. They tried all kinds of things, including an elevator and uh, a trebuchet. And uh, seriously, they tried that. Uh, mm -hmm. Lightweight and uh, easy to manufacture, very easy to set up, um, and very repeatable. But a clothesline turned out to be the best idea, so that's what they used. Okay, and it didn't have to be real. A lot of stuff, a lot of stuff came out of fiction, science fiction especially. Okay. And if anybody wants to interrupt with suggestions, they can. So what did we end up with? As I said, some worked, most failed. At the time, this was, by the way, normal. Most companies in the United States, as you'll probably all remember, would have considered it ludicrous to put only one team on a critical project. It was normal to put uh, multiple teams on any significant uh, project. And if the, uh, whoever succeeded first, that's what they used. And uh, the, other, and the uh, other engineers, they weren't fired, they were just put on other projects. Okay, so the best got us to the moon. The rest got us a lot of profitable industries that we're still using and made some uh, of our old industries a lot more profitable. Okay, and okay, and that's, I said, that's what this series is about. We're gonna cover GPS velcro cruise control which are things everybody uses and in this audience if you like i'll skip the velcro and go to uh, lasers which uh, didn't actually get us to the moon but got us one of uh, helped a lot of our current industries uh, by the way as everyone knows the uh, lasers were around before apollo okay but i'll get to the where apollo comes in later all right uh explanation of GPS. Okay, I'll give a little extra. I'll give a little. All right. Uh, four and tw uh, let's see, how's it go? Warble, warble, um, oh, how's it go? Warble, warble, little sat. How I wonder where I'm at. Twice around the world each day, four and twenty birds at play. Clear endeavor, steady beat, pseudo random code repeat. And that's literally all it is. It's a bunch of uh, 24 satellites active that uh, are playing a tune over and over again, uh, approximately 10,000 times a second. And you have built into uh, your receiver a copy of each of the tunes that they play. They, each one plays a slightly different one, okay? And you keep time with it. Your device keeps time with it, tries to match it up. From that timing, as the, it knows where each satellite is above the horizon. When uh, the satellite is coming towards you, anybody heard of the Einstein-Doppler effect? It plays faster. When it sets, it plays slower. You simply have to count the speed at which your plane keeps up with it and do a little bit of trigonometry, four-dimensional trigonometry, and you know where you are. 
That system, however, also depends on your device having a number in it called the uh, uh, gravitational potential of the Earth. And it needs to be accurate. Uh, in general today, it's uh, known accurately to, I believe it is 14 places. Anybody remember after Apollo landing, the State Department publishing that number to 11 places? Now, I, in grade school, memorized that number at the time. At the time, I didn't understand also why the State Department was publishing it. Of course, I didn't really understand what the State Department was, so. But it was a, at the time, it met the political goals because it was two things. It was one, proof we'd been to the moon, since that's a natural hash. You can't get that measurement from the surface of the Earth. There's too many fluctuations in the gravity field near it. Uh, Anybody, if anybody's ever moved a uh, pendulum clock just from one floor to another, or put it over a garage where a car goes in and out, they'll know the time changes that the, uh, the pendulum swing will be off enough just from introducing a car underneath it to uh, lose uh, seconds per week, or gain seconds per week. So you can't measure the gravitational potential of the Earth until you get several dozen uh, Earth diameters away from it. So that number was proof we'd been there, had complex equipment that at the time could not be automated. It'd still be ex extremely expensive to automate it today. Uh, and it was also that hash could be verified by other, um, other entities. It's sort of like saying, we know where you are. We in fact know where everybody is. And you can test that. <laughs> okay. So where it comes in here is trying to touch the moon. You want to touch the moon. You don't want to crash into it, not with a manned vehicle, not if you're going to bring them safely back to Earth. But it's a problem in accuracy similar to um, uh, everybody here knows what the Wachovia building is, downtown Winston-Salem. OK, imagine trying to toss water balloons to the top of the Wachovia building without breaking any, without knowing. Go ahead. From the ground? From the ground. From the road out front. Try and toss a water balloon up to it so it just lands there without breaking. With unsteady wind. And you don't know the exact height. Because that was the situation with the moon. We didn't know its exact distance at the time. We knew approximately within about 1%, but that was about that's the best you could get by a telescopic observation. Go ahead. 1% of 800,000. Right. <laughs> yeah, 800,000 was the round trip. That's about 400,000 kilometers, 384,000. OK. So that's the problem they had to solve. And as usual, there were lots of them. OK, one, Jules Verne proposed a cannon. Launch at just the right speed, and you would just make it to the moon. Of course, you might have a little problem. Uh, how many people have noted that when there's a rocket launch, there's usually a lot of flame at the bottom? Now, how many people here have noted that behind a jet engine, there's not a lot of heat? Uh, I can't think of an airport around here, but there's several airports around the country, some may have seen it, where they will have blast deflectors where the uh, runway goes close to a road. Have you ever noted that those uh, blast deflectors are made out of plastic and sometimes wood? Would you want to put a blast deflector made out of plastic or wood behind the exhaust pipe of uh, your automobile? What would happen if you did? It wouldn't be there. It wouldn't be there. It would burn up. Jet engine, ideally, emits uh, its gases at the same temperature that it brings the outside air in, and likewise a rocket engine. You know, in fact, they're not 100% efficient, so it does raise it up. But what makes the flame is the fact that you're shooting out a lot of matter, 1,500 uh, kilos a second, at meteoric speed in sea level pressure. It's billions of meteors going off right there. You go up high. How many people saw the uh, interim upper stages uh, launch from uh, the shuttle in orbit? Anybody? OK. Uh, well, you can look that up after this. There's no flame. How many people remember the Apollo 15? Uh, was it Apollo 15 or 16? 
uh, launching from the moon and captured by the camera. Okay. Was there a flame? No. Right. There was no flame because there was no atmosphere to create it. Go ahead. That explains why those people in that little island that had the airport right by the end of the water, they get on that fence there, and they that's why they don't burn up, huh? That's right. <laughs> Mm -hmm. If you can hold on, you can put your hand behind the back of a jet engine and it's not going to get burned. But it's going to get thrown away. Might get thrown away along with the car you're in and the rest. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so, and rocket engines are like that too. That's one reason they're efficient. Okay. So, okay, we got that. Uh, of course, others uh, had so. Yeah, well, and when you land, you're going to land at escape speed. If you don't break, you're just going to hit the moon. Even if you get it precisely enough to just make it there, not fall back to Earth and not go beyond the moon, you're still going to land at about two kilometers a second, which is not easy to survive. All right. Now, fiction had lots of them. In particular, anybody here see Buck Rogers? Okay, lots of people. Very good show. I highly recommend if you go see, see the pre-World War II, uh, II ones. They're great. They stand the test of time. All right, how about E.E. E. Doc Smith? Okay, he wrote the Lensman series, which Star Wars was originally supposed to be based on, according to John, uh, uh, according to Lucas, but he very, uh, but he varied from it to a great degree and did a wonderful job. All right, Robert Heinlein. Now, what they tended to use was continuously throttled jets and the idea of shaping orbit. They basically refer to if you're on a large sea vessel, you continuously run the motor, but you steer in order to gradually curve your course so that it keeps you going to where you want to go. So you keep a continuous uh, throttle, but you change your course a little bit with the steering. And that's what was generally assumed was going to happen with the space flight. You'd use rocket engines continuously and uh, steer. Now, by the time uh, Robert Heinlein came along, they recognized that it would be more efficient to have longer runs and coast a lot of the way, but it was still a tendency to uh, um, fire continuously over a very long interval and shape your orbit to what you wanted. Okay, and that's what actually was NASA's original intent. I'll begin to that. So, for landing on the moon, they call that a direct in, direct out. You basically come straight down, slowing until you touch the surface at zero velocity. Okay, the problem with that is it uses exponential fuel. Now, it starts out if you uh, uh, can. May, uh, take advantage of it, it starts out with a very low constant on that exponential growth. So in an ideal situation, it's actually the most efficient way. You basically free fall until you get to where um, to do otherwise would cause a crash, and then you use full thrust to just come to a stop at uh, ground level, and that's your most efficient way. Problem. What would happen, if, anybody want to make a guess what would happen if you tried that coming into Earth? Oh, isn't that what SpaceX is doing? No, no, actually they are not. SpaceX is using uh, aerobraking. They're using a parachute, essentially. They don't, they, when they get, they use the aerobraking to come in and slow down to uh, subsonic speed. They don't use the retro rockets until they get very close, until they get essentially down to ground level where you can't use a parachute to stop, but you can use the rocket, you can use them to slow down enough that you don't need much, uh, you don't have much velocity left for the rocket to counter. The problem, go ahead. Okay, the problem comes if you have an atmosphere. If you try to do that, you're going to be going so fast in thick atmosphere, you're going to burn up. Or you're going to have your, the friction is going to start doing other damage to you. All right. When they started the Apollo program, um, the, they were going to use a direct in, direct out. That had already been planned by NASA. They were looking at it. It was called the NOVA project, which we'll get into a little more later. Um, but they were assuming the moon had no atmosphere. 
The astronomers have been saying for centuries, yes, it does. We see meteors occasionally in the lunar atmosphere. But it was assumed that it was a pure vacuum. We sent Ranger uh, to the moon. Ranger was like the most of the original Lunas. It was just a, a rocket shot at the moon. It uh, crashed into the moon. Before it did so, it took pictures. Now, most of the Rangers missed the moon or failed otherwise, but Ranger 7 was the first one that actually made it to the moon. And it had an accelerometer on board for the purpose of controlling it precisely as it left Earth, getting a precise delta V, which would aim it correctly at the moon. That telemetry, though, was still going when it reached the moon, and it showed a deceleration before they hit the moon. Wasn't, didn't, they didn't get much data from it because it was very shortly before hitting the moon. But they found it surprised everybody, despite what the astronomers have been saying. And so they found the moon does have an atmosphere. Now, if you're trying to breathe it, you got a problem. It's a little too thin. But if you're trying to come in at orbital speed, it'll knock the landing gear off your lunar module. It basically corresponds to about a 50 knot uh, wind at sea level pressure at uh, escape speed. So it's thin, but it's there. So the, when they did the surveyors, the surveyors actually did use a dido, direct in, direct out. But, and it was, it was basically a scale model of what the NOVA would have been. Launch directly from Earth, go straight to the moon, come straight down, and uh, land with retro rockets, Robert Heinlein style. The problem was, if they did that, Surveyor wasn't likely to survive, and neither did the Lunas that tried that earlier. It, they failed and don't know the reason why, but it's at this point assumed it was because they hit the atmosphere and the Soviets had no way of knowing about it. We didn't. But Ranger, uh, what Surveyor, they made some last minute changes. In particular, they were able to add a little bit to the coding, the programming on it, so that it would first fire the rocket to slow down to make atmospheric interface at a more reasonable speed and then do the Dido approach, a lot like the SpaceX uh, re uh, boosters coming back. But that costs more fuel. As a consequence, the surveyors only could carry about a tenth of the payload they were originally supposed to. And we go to the next one. Okay, uh, whoops, not on this one. So, get to that a little later. Uh, that one. Okay, did I miss one? Oops, closed. Okay, so if they had tried, so that's when they had to switch from the Nova to the approach that we ended up using, a mothership. Launch, uh, uh, into parking orbit, go to the moon. The reason for parking orbit was primarily the available trajectory they could calculate. But okay, go to the moon, orbit the moon with a mothership, command module, service module, and then use a shuttle, the lunar module, to go down to the surface. Reduce other problems. All right, so problem is, one, how do we get guidance to get to the moon? How do we know when to stop? How do we know where to, how to put that water balloon right on top of the Wachovia building and not 10 feet up where it breaks or 10 feet low where it doesn't even make it. Okay, we don't know the distance. We use stereoscopic vision to estimate how far to throw something. Okay, um, but how do you, uh, you can't use the stars, which is what was used for orbital insertion with the early satellites on Earth. They looked at a particular star, they knew where it was supposed to be, they gave them an angle, and they could use that to go into a circular orbit or whatever orbit was desired. All right, remote control from the ground from three seconds away, which is light speed, you can't do it. Um, animals and a lot of people, of course, use landmarks. Street signs! Well, there's no street signs on the moon telling you you're getting close. So you don't know when to slow down exactly. Now, we do know, and they'd already used with uh, stars, Doppler. Okay, 
And by the way, they tried these, all these things I'm saying that were uh, as other options that didn't work. NASA tried them, tried to figure out a way to make them work. Okay. Uh, frequency changes with speed. We all know that here today. We're uh, very well. And it changes in gravity. Okay, but prior to, survey, to Ranger, we didn't know the distance to the moon or its gravitational potential better than about 1%. We didn't even know. Uh, they were still debating whether at that time whether the uh, moon was uh, denser than the earth, lighter, whether it would float in our oceans. We uh, just didn't know. Because how, how would you calculate? How would you calculate the mass of the moon? Any proposals? Okay. The way they know the mass of things like Jupiter is because it's got moons around it. You can check the uh, timing of the moons to calculate it. But the, our moon doesn't have a, a known moon around it. Not until... Ranger and uh, those. That's, mind you, it was a less than one orbit moon. It <laughs> just plowed into it, but it could still be used to calculate it. And that gave us to about 0.01%. That's not enough to put something down within two meters, by the way. That's uh, so it's not good enough. Okay. Um, distance, planet fall. Um, Planet fall, by the way, in case you're not aware, that's the term for making the approach to a planet. If you're in an airplane, you make an approach to an airport that gets you close enough to get on final, which is your last segment. But you start from en route, and then you have to get at least uh, lined up with the airport. So the equivalent of that in space flight is called planet fall. Now, the Apollo limb actually did use a shaping orbit approach. It did so above the atmosphere until it was slow enough for the Dido. They called that, by the way, the high gate, about 340 meters above the surface. Okay. Now, when you do that, um, the problem is, if you're coming, the uh, phi is the angle between the uh, horizontal, the horizon, and your approach vector. If you're doing a Dido, it's 90 degrees. You're coming straight down. If you're coming in from a uh, orbit from a mothership, it's almost zero. It's called low phi. Much harder problem because let's suppose you uh, fire your retros going that way. Let's suppose you fire your retros a little too much. Well, you're going to start falling. But as you fall, you're going, to imp speed. you're going to gain speed relative to the ground. So you're going to need to uh, put a lot less uh, thrust remaining. And it becomes a growing problem. With what they started, a small early air grows. 300 meter course accuracy, you needed at the entry point, 300 meter course accuracy, even with the moon's gravitational, uh, with the moon's gravitational potential under 1%, and you'd have a 20,000 meter error by the time you stopped your horizontal velocity. If you were off by 300 meters when you started, you'd be off by 20,000 meters when you came to a horizontal stop. And the lunar module did not carry enough fuel to handle a 20,000 meter straight in drop. If it had, why would they bother with it? <laughs> okay. So it's a very sensitive problem. Um, okay. <laughs> now, as I said, geogravit gravitational potential is a natural hash. You can't measure it on the surface of the Earth because you just put a boulder, move a car, and your measurement of the field strength changes. So, um, but you can measure it, if nothing else, by shooting ICBMs around. You can uh, verify whether you got the correct one. Okay, so this was the number that Apollo came up with. Apollo 10, actually, by the way, um, that was uh, needed. And if you know that, that would give you, without atmosphere, without Earth's atmosphere, a 30 meter error in GPS on Earth. Now, it's been refined since then, and that was the purpose for the Apollo 10. Anybody wonder why Apollo 10 didn't land on the moon? They had a lamb. Why didn't anybody before wonder why they didn't land? That's the reason. If uh, when they went, they would have uh, only had a one in four chance of uh, if they had given them the fuel, they deliberately put uh, inert material in to avoid the temptation. Uh, 
<laughs> but uh, if they had had the fuel, it tr they would have had only, based on what we had, they'd have only had a one in four chance of it even being possible to land. As it turns out, by the way, they were actually w uh, within the range. They, they uh, theoretically, they could have made it. Would have been very hard and very uh, would have been a very, very high oh, risk. Yes. But it could have theoretically been done. And now this information, the astronauts didn't ha didn't steer it per se. They steered it with cruise control. It's called an AGC, an autopilot, mm -hmm. that was developed just for it, and it actually created the ergonomics that we now think of as cruise control, which I'll get to. But that was able now to reduce that gravitation. I think I got a typo here because I think it was one percent on surveyor. That got the moon's gravitational potential down to the 0.01 percent that was necessary to attempt the landing. Okay, so GPS, which does the same problem in reverse, came out of that. We got the constant we needed from mm -hmm. Apollo, and the technique was made, uh, was used essentially, developed from there for uh, Earth use. We had Navstar 1A, there were a few, there were other, a lot of uh, uh, still technical difficulties, or but we had the theoretical possibility from that. Okay, so that was GPS. All right. Uh, so let's go to cruise control. Okay, and before I go on to cruise control, any questions, comments, et cetera, on the GPS, or any memories regarding any of this? Anybody? Okay. All right. Okay. The other thing is the goal. You want to make a soft landing, one you can walk away from. Go ahead. Who? Okay. Uh, means you got to accelerate from escape speed, about two kilometers a second, to walking speed at the surface. The lunar module was not very strong. I don't know if any of you have seen them in museums, the remaining ones. Okay, what can you tell me about when you saw it displayed in a the museum? There should have been something prominent underneath it. They were very light. Pardon me? The foot and the arm. Skinny legs. Skinny legs, very skinny legs. The lunar module could not hold itself up under Earth gravity. The legs were not strong enough. It would collapse under its own weight. So when you see them in a museum, either they've replaced the legs or more commonly, they basically put a shelf underneath it so the lunar module is sitting like a, the classic tarantula on a banana on, uh, with its center being supported rather than its legs. Okay. Um, and so you have to decelerate using less fuel than you brought. That's the key. And that's the hard part, actually. I mean, Robert Heinlein could, and others could work out the math that required to do a Dido landing, but notice a lot of them tended to assume that uh, fuel could produce infinite energy. Essentially, they either used uh, nuclear or uh, unobtainium or whatever was. Uh, they didn't usually worry about that little detail. Okay, so the proposal was died up, and NOVA was what had, no hardware had been built, but before Kennedy made his announcement, NASA had a, a project called NOVA to try and develop the techniques for how to get to the moon, how to design it. And they were figuring on a Heinlein-style single rocket. Uh, <coughs> now, if it went... Uh, direct in, direct... Ah, there we go. If it had gone direct in, direct out, NAVA... Uh, NOVA would have required 64 Saturn Bs to launch. That little bit of atmosphere made a big difference. Okay, and uh, all right, so if you're coming in high, the gravity vector doesn't change, so it's just a governor. That's as simple as it is. It's just a governor that you uh, change your thrust if you're going too fast, you uh, change your thrust if you're going too slow. But when it's an angle, because that changes the gravity uh, directly, you can't do that. Okay, so the surveyor ended up, when they found that out, it replaced its payload 90% with extra fuel and then slowed about five miles early, five miles above the surface, which it could detect by radar. And they would then hold four Gs until they hit a radar distance and then do a Dido uh, landing. Basically, five miles early, when you get to the point where the ratio says you're going to crash otherwise, you hold the four Gs and come down. 
So the original planned payload was about 400 pounds. They actually ended up using about 40, but they made it. And that was key. And of course, later the Lunahods uh, also successfully uh, soft landed on the moon. Uh, the Soviets learned from us, we learned from them. Not always above board, but <laughs> in fact, not usually above board. Okay, so proposals, lo-fi has an aerodynamic equivalent to a light breeze. You don't worry about it. Um, but I said gravity builds it down and it magnifies that air. So as I said about before, uh, these are a little different figures, but you see it uh, produce a large margin. You got to anticipate. Computers, and which weren't around at the time, and uh, analog uh, systems, analog computers, aren't very good at anticipating. So you needed a human pilot. You actually need a human uh, pilot to do the uh, approach. The Dido can be done with a governor, but the lo-fi approach? The Vikings on Mars were the first ones to do that with an automated system. And they gave each of them only a 50% chance of succeeding. Fortunately, two of them did. But that was a cutting edge at the time of the Vikings in the mid-1970s. Okay. So the proposal <laughs> was, we have analog computers. They're very good. They can handle a Dido landing, can't handle a lo-fi. How do you put, but uh, humans are very good at anticipating just what's needed. How do you put a human into an analog computer? How do you take advantage of his an anticipatory skills? All right, uh, humans do that all the time. Hand-eye coordination, we're very good at anticipating where that ball is gonna come to us. Uh, anybody here play baseball? Only one, only two? Oh, good grief, okay. What happened to the all-American sport? <laughs> All right, how many people play football? Also I only one. Play. <laughs> okay. All right. So, uh, yeah, we do the anticipation very well. So how do you fit that in? Okay, they, NASA did a lot of ergonomic studies at the time. Now, uh, various uh, piloting systems, of course, had been around for thousands of years. But in general, there was no engineering uh, design behind them. They were mostly trial and error. Uh, the stern post rudder, the uh, uh, use of a jib, these things had been uh, found to work, but they really, except for trial and error, there wasn't much design behind them. There wasn't math yet behind it. Okay, NASA did the studies to put the math behind that. And what they came up with, they found out by, and when I say behind that, it's getting the pilot to interact successfully. What they uh, came up with was they found out that it works best if the system reports a state, what you are at now, and what the predicted outcome is gonna be at some condition in the future, such as when you are about to land or about to transition to the Dido approach, about to switch off uh, from human and just come straight down. Okay. Uh, and then the human input commands a change of state. And that simple approach turned out to work for almost anybody. When they, uh, among other things, they tried that not just with trained pilots, astronauts, they tried it with random people. And they found out that after just a few trials, a handful of trials, almost anybody could uh, land the lunar module. And in fact, uh, there were multiple, one of the very first games that was available on a computer was mm -hmm. on the, um, uh, what was it called? Uh, one of the very first uh, Unix machines, which didn't have uh, monitors, they weren't around, uh, weren't common yet, had an oscilloscope and drew vector graphics on it. Um, used a light pen as input. Anybody, uh, okay, I should remember what those are. But anyway, it was one of the very earliest games and you would land uh, the lunar module. Yep. Well, I can tell. Put a number in the back. The fun part was crashing. <laughs> <laughs> you like put numbers in and see how hard you can hit the ground. Then you started to really do it. And there was only one guy who could do it. You know, I know the guy. Mm. In our class, 
you know, Eric Green, he was amazing. The guy, the guy designs the uh, front end uh, dashboards for large ships. Now. That's his gig. But he was he was the one guy that everybody you know tried to. And he had it. But uh, he, I remember him showing me the web. This is, you know, and that's what it was. It was okay. a well, I'll point you at a Linux game called Lander you should be able to find, written in C, by the way, <laughs> which uh, is probably from that, uh, was probably what the basic one was copied from. Because I know it uh, predated, it was, uh, it was uh, early 19s, no, it would have been late 1970s, I guess. But uh, anyway, uh, it's around, you can use it. It even, by the way, includes a... Uh, uh, an autopilot similar to uh, in two dimensions to what the astronauts had. They had two screens with uh, two crosshairs. One told them what the expected uh, velocity would be, vertical and range, uh, when they got to the high gate, when they were going to switch over, and what the horizontal uh, uh, offset would be. And all they had to do was keep the two dots on the crosshairs, which proved to be very easy. And from that, that's what today, I mean, what, what's your cruise control do? You have a speed on your speedometer, or a speed on your speedometer, showing you the current state. And um, you basically set an outcome, either to hold it or with a lot of them, you can, of course, uh, punch it, key it, move it, push a different button to get it to go up or down to the set rate. So you set what you want it to be, and people are very good at using that. Okay, so the LEM reported its altitude on the two screens when the descent, the, the approach would stop, and it said once was altitude, I'm sorry, I said velocity before, it's altitude and downrange, and then the second was horizontal velocity. So, and all they had to do was keep them centered, and it, trying to program a computer to do that when it's a non-linear function, it's not a polynomial, although they used a five uh, or fifth order polynomial to do the calculation of what the outcome would be if the state was unchanged. They basically took a fifth order approximation to a rocket taking off, and like you can do in land low computer, they just ran it backwards. And they fitted the predicted uh, radar uh, distance and velocity to uh, where the, uh, as an offset from where the fifth order polynomial predicted, and that was what actually fed the, uh, uh, the, the two monitors. Okay, change that. Ah, there we have, yeah, fifth order polynomial. Simulate the takeoff, constant threatened pitch rate. And what the astronaut, so the pitch rate was among the constant states, and what the pilot would do is he would with, uh, small jets, small cold rocket jets, adjust the attitude. And so as they came in, they were basically lying on their backs, right or below them, uh, or I should say, yeah, lying on their backs close enough. The field was at their feet, so they, were, they would feel like they were standing. But, and they would just gradually adjust the uh, attitude as they came in, thrusting constant until they got to that 340 meters. And on Apollo 11, they obviously did it very well. Well enough that they needed the extra fuel. If everybody remembers what happened then, but we won't go into that now. Okay. And so, as I said, we have cruise control. 1913, there was a wing level, or first demonstrated. First, uh, essentially, airplane autopilot. Worked similar to a sea anchor. Basically had uh, some internal vanes that tended to uh, hang, and it would, as the plane banked one way or another, it would resist, it would lag behind the uh, airplane, and that feedback mechanism would keep the wings level. Now, when I say level, that means actually in balance. You could still be in a turn, but you'd be in a steady turn. So, okay, 1958. Piper introduced the autopilot, and that's where we get the term from. Uh, it was their brand name, but the FAA adopted that as the generic term. You could sort of say they condemned the trademark. Uh, they paid for it, by the way. Okay, and that was based on 
Kalman uh, filter theory. Kalman filter theory was uh, a little esoteric, but one of the NASA made it common. Anybody here hear of Kalman filter theory before? One person. Okay, when did you hear of it? Okay. Yeah, NASA was, it, it existed before then, but NASA brought it to uh, engineers' attention. And they said the uh, human factors, it introduced it to engineers. 1965, it's no coincidence the year, this is just after um, NASA had the AGC and probably about the same time that the Disney years were put on the uh, simulator in uh, at the uh, uh, Kennedy Space Center. Any of you visited the... The simulator for the lunar lander, the static simulator, was built by Disney. And they put mouse ears on it. Okay. So that was the first where they did the mathematics. It they said the people have been making such piloting things for years, but it was more, it wasn't there wasn't the mathematical design logic for it. It wasn't cookbook. Okay. So that's cruise control. And now, choice. Uh, when has our time? Pardon me? Okay, and what have I got? Well, I can go, I've got uh, uh, about a seven minute closing or about uh, 30 minutes of material that can be cut down and we can also go with questions. I may, I probably can't answer all of them, but I can answer some. Maybe I got enough material here. Okay, uh, for closing, raise your hand. Oh, I like that too. For continuing, raise your hand. Oh, good! <laughs> All right, let's go with laser. Uh, anybody mind skipping Velcro? You want to go with Velcro or laser? Laser, okay. Now, laser wasn't really needed to get to the moon. Um, and lasers had only been around for about a decade uh, when Apollo was being designed. Um, there's a, to give you an idea, there's a 1950s um, Dimension X or X minus uh, one episode in wh uh, which the uh, laser is given a very good summary of how it uh, works. At a time within six months of when the first Maser was uh, demonstrated, it had been published, I shouldn't say it was demonstrated, it had been published. Now, before then, all the engineers learned, what was the, uh, I think it was the third law of thermodynamics. What was the third law of thermodynamics before then? Heat always flows from hot to cold bodies. You can't, it was said to be impossible to have a uh, receiver of energy that was not hotter than, excuse me, that was not cooler than what was providing the energy. That was absolutely impossible. Now, I might add that while that was generally what 99% of the engineers were told, there were physicists, small percentage, that did uh, recognize that the laws of entropy didn't actually require that. But nobody knew a way to do it. Okay, the laser, a lot of people Actually, as some people, is there anybody here who invented the laser before uh, Bell Labs? Okay. Uh, in the 70s, there were actually, I met a lot of engineers who claimed, rather credibly, that they had. But they didn't have the money or the resources to build it on their own, and they couldn't convince anybody because, of course, it was impossible. Couldn't possibly work. Broke the basic laws of thermodynamics. And, of course, they changed the laws of thermodynamics after the laser was <laughs> made. All right, so it existed and didn't really uh, make the Apollo program possible, but it's one of the, one of the things that came out of it has actually had one of the more widespread effects. Okay, when NASA was planning the Apollo program, the idea was it was actually supposed to start regular traffic between the Earth and the Moon. Um, the, uh, while it had been politically for the purpose of landing at least one man on the Moon and returning him safely, NASA was had actually planned that every one of the Apollo astronauts, all 20, within the program would walk on the moon in at least 10 flights. And uh, they also, uh, they divide them by blocks. 
17 was the first of what was called the uh, science block, the first time they had a non-flight uh, crew personnel on board. I think I forget the name of him, as a geologist. And unfortunately, it was also the last flight. But they were planning on having more of them. And one, and so a problem was, how do you reduce the cost of the future landings? How do you, if it's this hard to throw that water balloon up there, once you've done it, what do you do? What do you change? Especially if you can take advantage of the fact that you've been there. What can you do while you're there to make it much easier for somebody else to come along? Any suggestions? What was that? Gas station. That's one. You're right. Put a gas station up. I might add, by the way, that's uh, now being called Gateway in the current political push to go back to the moon. Uh, every, well, see whether we actually do it or not. But, right, put a gas station up. And, by the way, that was sort of the method the Soviets were going to use to go to Mars. They were going to put gas stations between here and Mars uh, in the form of uh, space hooks, which, by the way, is a trebuchet, space-borne trebuchet. You don't need to mount it to the ground. You just float it. <laughs> okay. Um, so, all right, what else can you do besides gas stations? Bingo! Waypoints, uh, markers. Okay. Now, uh, how do you make a marker that is big enough to uh, see from a large distance? Uh, well, what do you do to make uh, markers visible from Earth over a long distance? They have some distinguishing feature, right? Uh, we also illuminate them. Now, illuminating something on the moon means you've got to have a power source, a long-term one. So that would have been way too expensive. Batteries are very heavy and very expensive uh, to launch. So uh, today, you use solar. Very good. And solar sort of, sort of what they did. Okay. In other words, you want it powered from someplace other than where the sign is. Okay. So, how about leaving, how do you make a sign that is power, and the sun's probably not going to cooperate with us because it's got a lot of variation in it. So, how else could you make a, a sign that's powered by other than where the sign is, a reflector. And that's what they uh, came up with. Now, at the time, they really didn't know how to use it. And uh, there were, as far as I'm aware, at least, n there weren't any uh, published plans. Now, they likely did have another group. As I said they liked to, uh, that uh, this group might have had a, uh, somebody else working on a wild idea how to use it. But that was the idea. They wanted a reflector that could be uh, powered from the source. It's called a retroreflector, by the way. Everybody, does any, anybody want to give a 10-word explanation of how a retroreflector works? Like the material that uh, you'd have on a vest, a reflective vest? No? Okay. Uh, how many people have ever gone into a, uh, a store, like, to buy a suit and uh, order uh, a dress or something? And... Uh, been to where they have multiple mirrors set up so that you can look for multiple views at once. And in fact, have you ever noticed if they have the angles right, you can actually see behind? Okay. Now that's, uh, when they do that, when you can see behind, it takes three mirrors, right? All right. If those three mirrors are arranged in a triangle, then uh, you get a view that's vertically consistent. If you arrange those three mirrors at right angles in a, uh, at 90 degrees, essentially as a corner of a box, hence the reason it's sometimes called a cubic corner reflector, then the light coming in will bounce back in the same direction it came in, but flipped 180 degrees. It'll be a reverse image. So if you put an arrow this way, there will be an arrow that way superimposed on it. I'm sorry, excuse me, there will be an arrow with 180 degrees coming back. So there will be an arrow put back on it. You see the same, um, almost the same image. Now, it depends on having those mirrors exactly 90 degrees and exactly flat. So 
At the time, most reflectors like you would wear on your clothing aren't that precise. Okay. But they uh, came up with, for this, they made some very special ones, very high priced, but very lightweight. Okay, they, and let's see, go back one. Not yet for that. Okay, they made them out of fused quartz. Anybody know what fused quartz is otherwise known as? Silicon, Silicon dioxide. Okay, sand. If you, sand normally is uh, fused quartz along with uh, some contaminants. You purify it, you get uh, pure fused quartz. It's very transparent. And one of its other properties is like sand, it doesn't expand or contract much with heat. You can uh, heat it up almost to liquefaction. You can uh, cool it uh, down to where steel breaks and it doesn't change much. And unfortunately, that's a very good feature for something you're going to put on the moon. It's also a very good feature for something that you're going to expose to the elements and you don't want to change the shape. So they basically made quartz. Uh, they took uh, pieces of the quartz and they polished them into the uh, shape. For uh, Apollo 11, they made, uh, I believe it was 100, I'm not sure the exact number, uh, well, more than 100, they picked 100, and they put them into an array. Yeah, there's a picture of a similar one here, I think. Um, let's see. Nope. I have to move this over after I find it. But anyway, um, they uh, put them on the moon so that, ah, actually, I have it down here under resources. Scroll down. Okay, it's here somewhere. Other side, square. That, by the way, is the surveyor I was speaking of before, the motor for it. That's Forsyth. Okay, I'll go back up to, you know, we'll get it later. Oh, okay. So they uh, used these quartz ones. They could be made very fine. The, one of them from Apollo 14 is still operating. There's three of them still operating. One from Apollo 11, Apollo 14, Apollo 15. Uh, Apollo 14, it turns out, is so well manufactured that it has an antenna gain of 89 dB. Don't you wish you had that at home? Yes. At the time, that was pretty close to the theoretical manufacturing limit for any collimation that could be done. And it still got that after 50 years. <coughs> um, Apollo 15, they made a bigger one. And they placed them at three points on the moon. Uh, they also, by the way, had two on Apollo 16 and 17, which uh, don't work anymore. Presumably they got uh, covered or they gradually degraded, or in some way they don't work anymore. Uh, likewise, uh, Luna 17 and 21, which were Luna Hods. They were like our, uh, they were remote controlled robots that could roll around the moon. And they also had uh, reflectors. As I said, the Soviets copied us. We copied them, they copied us. Um, they, theirs don't work either anymore. Apollo 11's actually didn't, they supposedly, the anecdote, and I haven't been able to find full corroboration for this, but the anecdote is that when they were on the moon, they sent uh, tense pulses at the moon and they got reflections back from the uh, reflector they'd set up. But after they took off, it didn't work. They couldn't get reflections anymore. The assumption was that uh, the uh, they'd been covered up by the same stuff that if you see the uh, pictures from uh, the lunar module, the flag blew away. And uh, yeah, if, you go, if, if you've ever seen a lot of the movies, what do you see if you supposedly go back in fiction to the uh, first lunar landing site? You see this, right, you see this nice descent stage sitting there, pristine and nice and shiny. Anybody see what usually happens when you launch a rocket off uh, from someplace? Yeah, and if you've seen the lunar uh, reconnaissance orbiter pictures of uh, the Apollo 11 or other landing sites, that's exactly what it looks like. It looks like the burn from a, uh, a gun, a close uh, carbon uh, distribution, a burn mark. 
because that's basically what's there. You go back to the, it's, you're just going to find a crumpled aluminum uh, foil piece where the descent stage was, and a flag some uh, score meters away. And presumably, that's what they figured uh, stopped the Apollo 11. But they're working now. I wasn't able to find out exactly what, when they started working again, but Apollo 11 is now uh, working again as a laser reflector. It might have been actually just that as the laser, the, uh, having those reflectors there over the next, and this was where the benefit came in, it was serendipitous, but over the next several decades, as you started to collimate things, either lasers or other sources, they mm -hmm. used those reflectors on the moon to do the final calibration. When on Earth, the best they could do in 1960 was about a millimeter at 300 feet, about 100 uh, yards. And that uh, would be only enough at best, without atmospheric effects, to uh, cover about a 40 kilometer wide swath on the moon, 40 by 40 kilometers. So you're not going to pick up a landing site. You send a powerful enough pulse at it, you'll at least know there's something there, but that's about as good as you're going to do. Okay, as now, as the, they use those laser reflectors to make, to calibrate final lasers, because they would start out with one that might be too wide and then gradually calibrate it down, getting increasing reflectance back as they uh, covered, wasted less and less of the information on the, uh, uh, on the non-reflector. And so we ended up with uh, today laser uh, collimation that is on the uh, order of 120 dB. Pardon me? Exactly. Exactly. And so we've, and also that was used for making some of the, uh, uh, improving the density of uh, microcircuits. They use that for measuring. Those lasers weren't directly involved per se, because they're still, uh, you, uh, it generally takes a good amplifier, a good telescope, and a lot of uh, engineering to hit those things. So it's not something we carry around in our pockets. But it did have a major influence. You could, and you don't know how much could have been done without them. But they've definitely been involved in enough industry, just their effects alone, uh, assuming a uh, very generous attribution, to cover the entire cost of the Apollo program. And to the best of my knowledge, nobody predicted that. That was not one of the things they were targeting. Okay, so, and it's basically VASI. We talked about that. VASI is the equivalent of the lighted street sign, the reflective uh, road signs he brought up. The retro reflectors are generic. And there was we, there had been measure of light speed before by using uh, the Foucault method. In case anybody, anybody familiar with that? Anybody heard of that before? Okay. Uh, two mountains, uh, known distance apart. Shine a uh, light through a uh, gear that's spinning. Have it uh, bounce off a mirror on the other uh, mountain. And it, you can uh, get that set up when it's static, but before the gear starts turning. But as you start turning the gear, the light is going to be pulsed at the other mountain. And when it comes back, if the, you've passed one gear in the time it took for the light to go to the other mountain and back again, you'll see the light again. If you're a little slow or a little fast, you'll see the light brighter or dimmer. And so you can adjust it to... Uh, uh, get it exactly one gear traveling in the time it takes the light to travel over to the other mountain and back. That was one of the first ways to get a good measure of the speed of light, and one proof it wasn't infinite, but also get a good measure on it. Um, other people had already proved it wasn't infinite at that time, but they didn't have good measures. Okay, well you can do it in reverse. If you assume you know light speed accurately, you can use it to tell the distance to that other mountain, even if that other mountain's on the moon. And if you use a cubic reflector, the mirror doesn't have to be lined up that well. It has to be, it turns out, within about 16 degrees, uh, plus whatever error the astronauts introduced in setting it up. They, uh, when they put it down, they were already pre-calculated for their landing site at an uh, angle such that it would 
face the earth at the right angle, roughly, and then they had to adjust it. And they had, as I said, about 16 degrees margin, and since the earth is about uh, two degrees across, that was enough. The 16 degrees, by the way, was set by the cubic, uh, by the uh, fused quartz, that's uh, um, the uh, rims that they had on the shadow uh, effect. The, uh, okay, because they knew they, they didn't want to pick up signals from the sun and other aliens that might be out there. They just wanted them from Earth. Okay, so uh, focus, okay. So they, and the idea that they uh, sort of thought of at least was if they knew the distance to the moon, they could use it to more precisely calculate its orbit and thus. Right. Right, exactly. Okay. Um, <clears throat> do I have, whoops. Try and see if I got one of those pictures handy. I had it all set and of course don't have it quite as handy. All right, so we got uh, the lasers, and that's the short view of it. Um, as I said, the status. Uh, okay, there we go. Apollo 11, 14, and 15. Best was that, about 10 micro radians, 97 dB. That was for the best possible that was available on Earth at the time. Um, and we got it in the current one now, Apollo 14 is at 89 dB. Apollo 15 is bigger, but it didn't turn out to be quite as well collimated. Okay. Um, so, pretty good. 50 years and they still work. That's, that's a pretty uh, good experiment. Okay. So, we've come to the end. And, go back to, do I have it right here? Okay. As we said, Apollo had to solve problems. What are some of those problems that we said? Okay, distance, longest distance. Uh, never encountered before. Well, one thing that had never been encountered before was trying to land from low-fi orbit. On Earth, you can use a parachute. Simplifies things immensely. Moon's atmosphere isn't thick enough to use a parachute. Mars is, by the way. So we uh, did the uh, arrow braking by parachute and uh, retro rocket uh, landing or Dido landing or landing the Mars uh, Science Laboratory, Curiosity. First time that was uh, actually uh, done with aero braking was by that. Okay. Um, okay, never, uh, let's see, what else was never encountered before? Okay, not even imagined. Well, let's see, what was it, what, some of the things that weren't imagined? Um, well, one that wasn't imagined was the as far as I know, was uh, how to move in a uh, spacesuit, how to make a spacesuit that you can move in. Um, anybody, uh, when they were a kid, ever try uh, sitting inside a uh, tire that was, say, hanging from a tree as a swing? Okay, anybody has a, try to move inside the tire? You ever try to move it with your arms or anything? No, you didn't try that? Okay, I like to hang off it? Okay. How many people think they could? Okay. You have uh, rubber that is uh, supported by air pressure. If you change the volume on that air pressure even a little bit, at 15 pounds per square inch, what we have right here, that's a lot of energy. And you don't get it back usually. It goes into the rubber. So they had to figure with the spacesuits, they had to solve the problem. And they came up with the constant volume joint. A uh, joint that you can move, and unlike your arm expanding, it doesn't expand. It occupies the same volume, whether the uh, uh, it's bent or whether it's straight. And so that way you can, uh, it's still hard. Moving uh, in a spacesuit is uh, very tiring. It's even tiring if you're uh, surrounded by atmosphere, uh, i.e. Earth atmosphere. Okay. Uh, anybody else, any questions? Anybody else think of some of the things that uh, they had to solve. <laughs> all right, and they did it. In the Apollo 13 movie, you all, I take it, remember the scene where uh, they said the upper guys have handed us this problem. We got to make the adapter circular for this, fit into the hole designed for that square using only this. Everybody remember that scene? 
Okay. That by, uh, the movie was based on Lost Moon uh, by uh, uh, Colonel Lovell. And that scene, however, was actually played out uh, hundreds of times. When uh, uh, Gene Kranz said, bring everybody in, that was at the time about 300,000 contractors. And critical problems like that, they gave out to several teams. They gave it to teams that told them, okay, you've only got this stuff to work with. You've only got this stuff to work with. Uh, what are you going to do? And they came up with a lot of solutions. In particular, how many people know that uh, they had a, a nuclear battery uh, on board Apollo 11? Okay, they had one. It was at the time in the lunar module uh, cargo bay. It was to power the ALSEP, the Apollo Lunar Science Experiment Package, that they were going to leave. <clears throat> but since they weren't landing, it was now a spare battery. A battery that could have been used to power the command module. And in particular, it's carbon dioxide scrubbers. Then they could put the square modules in the square hole they were designed for. But it would have required doing a spacewalk. And the uh, lunar module, uh, it didn't have an air lock. They had to depressurize the lunar module to go out. And that would have, uh, with three people on board, and one of the spacesuits not designed for EVA, it was designed for orbital EVA, but it had very limited uh, capacity because it was intended to have its atmosphere supplied by umbilical. So it would have meant they would have been very rushed trying to get that thing out. And the question is, how would they be able to hook it in and use it? But that was one of the ideas that was uh, that actually went to uh, a simulation, to trying it, having people try it and see if it could be done. OK. Uh, but you'll notice, you don't see that in the movies. But they tried hundreds of approaches uh, to that. There were lots of rooms. And, of course, most of them didn't succeed. A few succeeded, did come up with solutions. And they, they picked the, uh, one of the reasons they picked the one they did was because if it failed, they could still try getting the battery out of the lunar module. If the lunar module failed, they probably wouldn't get another chance to try the one they did try. OK, any other questions? Any questions at all? All right, well, hope now, one, if somebody comes to you now and says we didn't go to the moon, I hope, among other things, you've got some proof that we did and you, that you can show them yourself. Thank you very much. That You're was uh, very interesting. I am interested myself in uh, space travel and have offered to buy my in-laws tickets to the first <laughs> 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 So thanks very much. Mike. You're very welcome. I do want to mention before we go to the business meeting uh, a week from tonight, 6.15 or 6.30 at 66 Pizza, everybody's invited. Is there anything else tonight? Yes. <laughs> Okay. I got one minor thing. Uh, we've had the trouble with the uh, cabling. I used to be an ARPANET liaison. Today it would be called an ISP, non-commercial, for um, Tim Mopias, a computer in California. One of the largest things I had to spend my time on was finding the broken Ethernet cables that had been eaten by the rodents, the mice. I went so far as to get what at the time I'd never heard of, pesticide-laced cabling, which they continued to eat. It made them a little easier to find, because I would look for the dead uh, mouse, but they'd still eat the, ins they'd still eat the cables. Very interesting. Okay, do I hear a motion? Motion. Hear a second? Okay. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>